Good evening, Tributes, and welcome back to Tales of the Hunger Games. I hope that you've had a great two weeks, and that wherever you are, your lockdown is going okay and not driving you insane. So from now on, we are moving into uncharted territory, but I hope you continue to enjoy. This video, along with many future ones, will feature art that is created by Andrew McLean. Please check his link that will be included in the description, along with all the other links that are associated to this series. I will go into more detail about them at the end. One other little thing is that in this video I will not be revealing who the victor is until they have won. And the hazard, or hazards, will not be revealed until they have occurred. So for those of you who like to check the comments before the end of the video, do this at your own risk, as I'm sure it will soon become spoiler central down there. Anyway, without further ado, let's go. The unofficial capital games took place in the year 78. Shortly after the Second Rebellion, the new president of Panem, Leith Pela, signed the abolishment of the Hunger Games into law. However, in the early months of 78, a voice recording from 76 was leaked from the now defunct District 13, which appeared to show the surviving seven victors voting for another Hunger Games with capital children. It is unknown why the result of this vote was not originally put into effect, but it is most likely due to the subsequent assassination of District 13's representative, Alma Coyne, that the surviving seven did not originally wish to pursue these games. An upcoming reporter, Ludo Ring, from the now leading media outlet Panem Today, ran open investigations into this recording throughout the early months of 78. To the shock of many district citizens, it was revealed by several of the surviving seven that the recording had not been created or edited by District 13, and that they had in fact voted in favour of these games back in 76. Within a week of this calamitous revelation, President Paler was practically interrogated on live television during a now infamous interview with Ludo Ring, who wanted to know why these games had not occurred as planned. Paler stated that no version of the Hunger Games, not even one with capital children, would ever happen again. This announcement triggered unrest, with an array of savages in various districts showing their outrage and not being able to witness these games. Despite the decline in district production that occurred during these riots, Paler initially reiterated that she would not approve these games under any circumstances, but as the riots continued and the levels of damage increased, Paler appeared to realise that Panem could not withstand another rebellion. She therefore approved these capital games, but on the condition that they would only occur once and never again. These terms were accepted by district representatives, and plans were made to put the games into effect. A game-making committee was formed, and the surviving seven were each asked if they would like to play a role in creating these games. Although most of them declined to take part, Inabaria Golding and Joanna Mason both accepted this invitation, with Inabaria being offered the role of head game-maker, which she gratefully accepted, whilst Joanna was placed in charge of the pre-game events, such as the reapings and the parade. Prior to the reaping, it was unknown how many of the Capital's children would fight in the games, and whether they could be reaped from all Capital families, or just those that had been most involved in the resistance to the Second Rebellion. Unsurprisingly, this lack of certainty caused chaos within the Capital, which led to many families with children between the ages of 12 and 18 hiding their children in remote locations, such as the sewers, underground caves, and even on the roofs of buildings, in an effort to avoid the reaping. In order to calm this panic, Joanna Mason released a list of 26 boys and girls who could be reaped. These were the children of some of the most senior authorities of the capital, many of whom were now deceased. Most of these 26 were subsequently taken to the Tribute's accommodation quarters, whilst the others, who had gone into hiding, were soon delivered to the rebel forces by various tyrants and other children, who had been offered financial incentives for finding and capturing them. The reaping took place in Viewing Square, with an extremely large crowd in attendance and live footage of the event being televised throughout Panem. The 13 boys were all placed in one enclosure and the 13 girls were in another, whilst Joanna and Inabaria stood on a raised platform in front of the 26 and the surrounding crowds. Joanna started the reaping with a speech about why she and the other rebels believed they had a right to make these games before she reached the specifics of how this reaping would work. When Joanna mentioned that as usual, 12 boys and 12 girls would be fighting, anguished cries and screams were heard from the audience, of whom many believed that due to the small pool of potential tributes, there would be fewer actual tributes entering the arena. 
This also meant that only one boy and one girl from these 26 would be spared from the games. However, when the rebel guards on the platform suddenly pointed their weapons to the crowds, the noise swiftly quietened and the reaping commenced. Joanna took a name from the female tributes bowl, which was revealed to be Regina Canville. The cameras then showed Regina, aged 14, as she let out a shrill wail and had to be dragged to the platform by rebel guards, who cruelly pulled her by her bodacious afro and she tried to kick them away, but to no avail. Inabaria then chose a male tribute, and the two women took it in turns to pick from each gender. The children in the enclosures were understandably petrified by the ongoing proceedings, which produced a range of cries and screams from the audience as well. When names were called, the corresponding tributes would often shout out in fear and objection, or try refusing to walk to the platform until they were threatened by the guards. When Paris Harrington, aged 16, was called, she even tried running into the audience until a guard tackled her and marched her to the platform. Corio Fling, aged 16, swore loudly before being punched in the mouth by a nearby guard, and he proceeded to spit blood as he was dragged to the platform. Towards the end of the reaping, Rascus Bocelli, aged 18, was called, and he hardly reacted, which made him practically the only tribute to not protest in some way. The last girl to be reaped was Lucretia Jasper, aged 18. She stood there somewhat calmly, with a dazed expression, before removing a fascinator from her hair and running it along her throat. It was not until a pool of blood started dripping from her neck to the floor that the audience started shouting, when they appeared to realise that this fascinator had a blade attached to its side. Screams were heard as Lucretia fell to the floor, and there was a justified outrage from within the crowd but it was quickly suppressed when the guards shot bullets into the air. As Irene Al-Fayed, aged 15, who is now the last remaining female, looked on in shock, a guard came forward and grabbed her by the arm before leading her to the platform. It became eerily clear at this point that 13 of each sex had been chosen, in case this sort of incident occurred. Once all 12 male tributes and 12 female tributes had been reaped and were standing on the platform, Jurgen Cardew, who was the only unreaped member of the 26, was allowed to leave his enclosure. As he fled to his parents in the audience, Irene, who had so far remained practically expressionless, started to cry. This year's parade was also slightly different, with tributes being allowed to choose which clothes they would wear. The children were ordered to march in a single file to the end of the parade, before coming back. They were clearly nervous from the bright lights and intimidating venue for this parade. This year's audience was made up of both capital and district citizens. Although in past years capital citizens had kindly thrown flowers and other gifts to the district tributes, the reactions of this year's audience varied from cheers and applause all the way to throwing sticks and rocks at tributes. Arabella Snow, aged 14, was even hit in the eye with a stick, which caused her to shout out in pain before bravely continuing forward. Most of the tributes wisely dressed in moderately smart attire, in order to not make the district citizens envious. However, Paris decided to dress in a sparkling gold dress and necklace, complete with matching jewels through her hair. She tied her long blonde plaits into a bun, and this allowed her to show her cleavage, which made her rather noticeable, although she had to dodge a few sticks here and there from jealous district citizens. Irene, who was walking in a modest blue dress behind Paris, seemed surprisingly glad by the fact that the attention was being taken away from her and towards Paris instead. Rascus and Corio were placed towards the back of the parade. Rascus wore a modest light brown outfit that matched his short brown hair and big brown eyes. On the other hand, Corio wore a bright sequin suit of pink and cream colours, which was perfectly coordinated with the pink streaks through his blonde curls. Corio confidently waved at the crowd until a rock hit him on the foot, and to the amusement of some, this caused him to trip over. However, as Corio lay on the ground, Rascus approached him from behind and helped him back up. Corio gratefully nodded back to Rascus as he carried on, and the parade continued as normal, although it was noted on a replay that Regina laughed at Corio's misfortune. The final tribute in the parade was Maclean Heavensby, aged 17. He wore a fabulous red suit, along with a flowing scarlet cape and maroon cane. While some of the audience shouted abuse at him, most applauded his style, and it later came as no surprise that he was voted as the best dressed in Anderson fashion. When he neared the end of the parade, he pressed a button on the top of his cane, which saw his cape quickly turn a frosty white, and a white powder resembling snow flew off the cape in all directions. This caused a cheer from the audience, 
but a few jeers from district savages, who clearly lacked the creativity to think of a similar design. The training began the next day. It was a sorrowful affair, and most of these tributes, who had never expected to have to take part in such a barbaric activity, did not even know where to begin. Neither Paris nor Corio had apparently ever touched a knife in their lives, and the pair, who it soon emerged had been friends since childhood, spent most of the first days sitting in the survival station, but it was during this time that they agreed to ally together during these games. Irene, on the other hand, used most of the first day to revise what she knew about plants. It soon emerged that she had had a strong relationship with one of her family's Avoxes, who taught her about poisonous plants. She also seemed to spend the day watching Raskus throwing spears at targets in front of her. As Raskus was one of the few tributes who had at least some knowledge of weaponry, Irene approached him and asked if he could show her how to use a spear, and in return, she would teach him the basics of herbal toxicology. Raskus agreed, and the pair built up a surprisingly strong rapport, which allowed them both to learn from each other's knowledge, and by the end of that day, Irene could at least throw a spear in the right direction, and Raskus was able to identify several of the most poisonous berries. On the final day of training, Inabaria decided to make each of the tributes complete an endurance test, in a room adjacent to the main training room. Seeing as this had never been done before, it is generally believed that she did this in order to exhaust the tributes before their assessment the next day. Almost all tributes lined up in order to enter this room, but Corio audaciously remained seated in the survival station. When he was told once more by Inabaria to join this line, he suddenly launched into a verbal attack against her, where he insulted her in a variety of ways, and ended the tirade by stating that her teeth made her look like a deformed shark. When Corio said this final insult, Inabaria, who had been calmly glaring, slowly walked towards him while staring straight into his eyes. This even made some of the other tributes, who were all avidly observing, seem rather petrified as she approached. Inabaria asked Corio to repeat what he had just said about her teeth, and he swallowed calmly, before once again saying that she looked like a deformed shark. Inabaria immediately grabbed Corio by his neck and smashed his head against the wall. She proceeded to bare her teeth and seemed ready to bite Corio there and then, but some other staff rushed over to pull her away. As they did so, Corio shouted, You couldn't even save Brutus! And Inabaria immediately rushed back towards him. She was once again pulled away by the training staff and she stormed out of the room. The endurance test did not go ahead as planned, and the tributes continued practicing for the rest of the day. Whilst Paris was talking to Corio, Raskus approached the pair and congratulated Corio on his courage for standing up to Inabaria. At this point, Paris seized her opportunity and asked Raskus if he would join their alliance. Raskus appeared slightly unsure at first, but after looking back at the inactivity in the rest of the room, he turned back to Paris and accepted her offer. The next day, the assessment of training scores occurred as planned. Although some of these tributes refused to display any skill and were given scores of 1, most tributes displayed some sort of skill, but were unfairly given low scores by Inabaria and the other assessors. Paris tried throwing some knives, but without much strength or accuracy, which saw her score just 2. Corio threw the same knives with slightly more accuracy, and he walked out with a score of 3. In total, 16 of the tributes scored either 3 or less. For Irene's assessment, she stated that she was not very good with weapons, but that she was better at avoiding them. She therefore asked if some assessors could come down to the floor and throw non-lethal objects at her, which she would try to avoid. At first, this suggestion was met with laughter by most of the assessors, but Inabaria, who remained surprisingly serious, approved the suggestion, and two of the assessors came to the floor. Irene did indeed manage to jump from an array of objects that were thrown at her, sometimes from close distances, and her fast reaction times impressed the assessors. However, as she left, she looked at Inabaria and stated that they were not enemies. This left the assessors temporarily speechless, and she ultimately scored a 5, which saw her as one of this year's highest scorers. Immediately following Irene's unconventional display was Bartholomew Sickle, aged 16, who chose to list an almost encyclopedic collection of knowledge about how various victors had managed to win their games, along with detailed descriptions of the decisions that other strong opponents to these victors had made that had cost them victory. Although this was once again a less typical display of talent, Bartholomew scored a 6, which made him the third highest scorer of this year's tributes. The highest scoring tribute was Raskus, who threw spears and knives at a selection of targets with surprisingly strong precision. 
when he finished this display, he mentioned to the assessors that before the Second Rebellion, he had been training to lead a peacekeeper company. This admission was met with an uncomfortable silence, but he managed to score a 9, which saw him top this year's training scores. The next day, the interviews took place in the same studios that had been traditionally used before the Second Rebellion. Tributes were once again allowed to select what they would wear, although many appeared to have learnt from the parade, and this time opted to wear clothes that appeared less extravagant to the standards of a district viewer. Ludo Ring, who was responsible for seeing these games happen, conducted the interviews, and although he tried to emulate the former host, Caesar Flickerman, his overly inquisitive style intimidated many of the tributes, and unfortunately, this led to a lot of jeering and negative reception from the audience, which was mainly made up of district citizens, who had been invited to the capital especially for this event. The interviews immediately started on a sour note when the first tribute, Gloss Monty, aged 15, spent most of his time snarling at Ludo, before suddenly getting up and loudly swearing at the audience. His outburst, although justified, was met with negative chants and jeers from the crowd, and he was swiftly removed by security, whilst continuing to shout about the injustice of these games as he was dragged off the stage. Paris was the next tribute after Gloss, and although she was not rude to the audience, they did not take kindly to her, and just like in the parade, it appeared that many were jealous of her exquisite sense of style, and finely designed white dress and matching heels. Towards the end of the interview, she was asked what she thought her chances of survival were, and many of the crowd burst into laughter, which sent her running off the stage in tears as the laughter increased. Just like in the assessment, Raskus once again performed well, although there was an awkward silence when he mentioned that he had been training to lead peacekeepers in the past. That said, he quickly recovered and spoke about how he was looking forward to showing that capital citizens could fight just as well as those from the districts, and this rather surprisingly garnered cheers from the audience. Unfortunately, there was another uncomfortable moment during Corio's interview, when Ludo asked Corio what he thought of the disappearance of his sister, Sinita, and the former victor, Flint Harrison. Corio appeared rather nervous when this topic was approached, and he quietly mumbled that he did not know. Ludo quickly changed the subject by asking Corio what he thought of the event so far. Yet when Corio voiced his dislike for the training staff, this response was met with jeers, and just like his friend Paris, he voluntarily left the stage shortly afterwards. The penultimate interview was that of Irene, and her choice of clothes created what was arguably one of the most iconic moments of these games. As she walked out in a dark red shirt and trousers, along with the signature collar and headpiece, she was met with a mixture of applause and jeers from the crowd when they realised that she had intentionally dressed like an Avox. For once, Ludo was left speechless, and Irene walked straight past him to the front of the stage, where she stared out into the crowd and held her hands to her neck, which was the common sign for an Avox. Irene adamantly stood there as the applause and clamouring raged on, with several fights even breaking out between different audience members. When the audience finally quietened down, she loudly stated, This is not the answer, we are not your enemy. She then walked straight past Ludo and off the stage, amidst continuous shouts and cheers. Just before noon the next day, the 24 tributes were each taken to a holding room underneath the arena, in order to wait for the games to begin. Once again, they were given a choice of what to wear for the games, bearing in mind that they would have no idea what the arena was going to be like. However, as part of a rather strange test that was created by Inabaria, each of the tribute's holding rooms contained a wardrobe that was full of clothing, which had been specially designed for a variety of arenas. Surprisingly, most tributes did not even notice their wardrobe, let alone open it to examine the clothing inside. Instead, most tributes nervously waited in the clothing that they had already chosen for the games, Paris was wearing a green and brown dress of a light texture. She even had her makeup done with a camouflage theme in order to match her dress. Meanwhile, Corio wore a brown shirt and black trousers, which was indeed less fashion conscious compared to his previous outfits. Irene and Raskus were two of just five tributes who actually used the clothes inside the wardrobes, and they both opted to wear a dark green jacket and trousers, each of which contained many sealable pockets along with a brown t-shirt and black shoes. Regina was one of the three other tributes who also used clothing from the wardrobe, although she appeared to be wearing clothes that were more suited to a colder arena than the arena in which tributes were actually placed. The countdown started a few minutes later, and all 24 tributes entered their tubes, which subsequently ascended into the arena.
The Capital Games took place in an arena that was known as the District's Revenge. When the podiums rose into the arena, many tributes seemed to be temporarily blinded by the glaring sunlight. As they looked around, they saw that they were in the middle of a very large grassy meadow, which was surrounded by dense forests of high trees. The forests of the arena contained a small variety of terrains, with only a few slopes, clearings and lakes scattered throughout. However, upon approaching various sections of the perimeter, tributes would soon learn that this arena was different to any that had ever been seen before. The tributes were given a countdown of 30 seconds, and roughly half spent most of this time looking away into the forest, whilst the other half seemed to focus more on the cornucopia. Within the cornucopia itself lay a myriad of weapons, featuring knives, swords, axes, tridents and more. Apart from the weapons, there are a few sleeping bags and coils close to the cornucopia, along with a decent supply of loaves of bread and water bottles further out from the cornucopia and closer to the podiums. As the countdown rocked down to zero, most of the tributes understandably appeared dazed and terrified by what awaited them. Dion Sickle, aged 13, stood on a central podium between Irene and Bartholomew. She started crying and begging the other tributes to not kill her once the gong sounded. However, the others remained focused on themselves and appeared to ignore her pleas. The remaining number of seconds ended single figures, and Gloss, who was stood on a left-hand side podium between Paris and Raskus, asked in a panicked manner if they were actually doing this. When no other tributes answered his question, or even gave him the eye contact that he seemed to be desperately seeking, his question was automatically answered. The gong subsequently sounded, and exactly half of the tributes immediately ran away towards the forest. Meanwhile, the other twelve sprinted inwards in different directions. Paris, Gloss, and Raskus each ran to the cornucopia, although when she apparently realised that Gloss would make it there before her, Paris stopped when she reached some of the loaves and bottles, which she quickly stuffed into her dress. She effortlessly held copious amounts of these supplies in her pockets, and it was later revealed that she had sewn pockets into this dress the night before the games. During that night's analysis, Ludo Ring, who was this year's commentator, admitted that perhaps Paris was more intelligent than she had initially seemed. Yet just as Paris was running to the area in front of the central podiums for more loaves and bottles, she spotted Raskus grabbing a spear and Gloss approaching him from behind with a knife. Paris screamed Raskus' name as a warning, and Gloss quickly readied the knife to throw at Raskus. But Raskus heard Paris' warning and was able to duck in time. He proceeded to impale Gloss through the neck and against the cornucopia's wall with his spear, before pulling it back out and dropping Gloss's body to the ground, then running back into the cornucopia for more targets to attack. During this time, Irene had run forward through the supplies and she had picked up a sleeping bag, but just as she looked back to grab some loaves and bottles, she was tackled to the ground by Vera Creed, aged 18, who apparently wanted this sleeping bag as well. As Irene lay on the ground, she held onto it like her life depended on it, whilst more tributes started entering the cornucopia for weapons, including Corio, who managed to grab a knife. When he looked back to see Vera fighting Irene, he ran straight towards the pair and stabbed Vera in the neck, just as she looked up at him. This sudden kill shocked many viewers, who had not seen Corio as being much of a threat to any other tributes. Irene quickly got up and thanked Corio, who was almost instantly joined by Paris. They watched as Yus Highbottom, aged 17, who had scored an 8 during training, was on the other side of the cornucopia, hacking Dion to death with a knife in each hand. Irene called to Raskus, who had just grabbed a trident from the cornucopia, and he ran in the direction of Paris, Corio and Irene, as they sprinted away from the cornucopia. Once all four of this group had made it into the forest, Paris and Corio caught their breath and Raskus asked Irene why she had wanted to get away before he had managed to get weapons for each of them. Irene seemed confused by this question, but she rather cryptically stated that she found she fought best without a weapon. The four of them jogged through the forest as they showed each other what they had acquired from the bloodbath. The girls had the sleeping bag, loaves and bottles, whilst the boys had a knife, trident and spear between them. They continued onwards for almost an hour until Paris insisted that they took a break which Raskus eventually agreed to. As they rested by a small lake, they heard just four cannons. It was later revealed to viewers that Linus Price, aged 12, had been killed by Regina shortly after he exited the cornucopia clearing, when she pounced down upon him from a tree and killed him with his own sword, which he subsequently stole before climbing back up the same tree. After resting for a bit longer, Raskus stated that they needed to continue onwards away from the cornucopia and they marched on. Yet as they walked, Corio started to scratch the skin beneath his shirt. 
Paris initially joked that he had lice, but as they walked up a steep incline within the forest, Corio's itching appeared to intensify, and both Paris and Rascus started scratching themselves beneath their clothing as well. Corio even removed his shirt, which revealed red blotches on his skin. He and Paris started to panic, just as Irene found herself itching her legs. The group painfully continued up the hill, but once they were at the top, they stopped and ended up removing most of their clothing. As Rascus tried to quieten Corio's shouts of pain and stop him from scratching into his skin even further, Irene made the seemingly random decision to climb up a nearby tree. Just as Paris was itching her legs some more, she asked Irene what she was doing, to which Irene replied that Paris needed to hold on and not scratch herself. Although she was struggling not to scratch her legs as she climbed, Irene managed to pluck a variety of leaves from the tree before climbing down as Paris watched on in confusion and Rascus continued to try and silence Corio. Irene then gave Paris some of the leaves and told her to rub them wherever she itched. Paris shot Irene a perplexed glance, but as Irene rubbed one different type of leaf after another against the blotches of her own legs, Paris proceeded to do the same with the blotches on her arms. Although some viewers were confused by what they were doing, after a minute or two of trying different leaves, Paris suddenly yelled out that a red mark on her left arm, where she had been rubbing a light brown clover-shaped leaf, had disappeared. Irene then took more of these clover leaves from her pockets and they continued to rub them over the irritated sections of their skin. To the girl's delight, these leaves seemed to alleviate their pain and Irene climbed the tree to grab more of these leaves, which she dropped down to Paris, who gave them to Corio and Rascus to use on their skin, which helped them as well. Eventually, after about 20 minutes, the itching had stopped for all four of them, although little did they know that the vast majority of other surviving tributes were still experiencing the same skin irritation. Paris, Corio, Rascus and Irene discussed and agreed to stay by the lake. As the afternoon went by, they rested, ate some bread and drank some water. Rascus showed Irene how to use the trident, and they proceeded to catch some fish from the lake, whilst Corio and Paris spoke about aspects of the games that they had never thought about before when they had watched them from their homes in the capital such as the heat and their exhaustion. Yet just as they were talking, Corio looked past Paris before suddenly stopping a sentence and putting his finger over Paris's mouth. Irene and Rascus, who had been quietly gathering the fish, noticed Corio's sudden silence, and they looked over to see a colossal bull standing just metres behind where Paris was sat. It stamped its hoof whilst intently watching Paris, who swiftly turned round before immediately beginning to whimper at the gargantuan size of the creature. As she started shaking with fear, the bull breathed noisily from its nostrils and stamped its hoof again into the ground. Rascus whispered to Paris and Corio to stay still, and Irene looked up to the nearest tree. Just as another bull came out from behind a tree on the other side of the lake and started to trot towards them. When she noticed the second bull, Paris rather fearfully sprinted back to where Irene and Rascus were standing. The first bull suddenly ran towards Paris, but when Corio also got up to run, this bull chased him instead and proceeded to skewer him in the back with its horn. Corio shouted out as he fell to the floor, and Rascus quickly threw his spear at the bull, which impaled it through its side and caused it to let out an irked grumble. Paris continued to run to the tree that Irene was already climbing, and as Rascus and Corio tried to fend off the bull, the girls climbed up to safety. Corio was now desperately trying to get up from the ground whilst using one hand to hold on to his wound and the other hand to push away the bull that was still trying to impale him with its horns. Rascus was attempting to remove his spear from the bull's side, but was struggling to grab onto the spear due to the slippery mud beneath his feet that was being made worse by the bull's panicked movements. However, he eventually managed to grab the spear and then thrust it through the back of the bull's head, which killed it instantly and sent it to the ground. Yet just as Rascus grabbed onto Corio's hand to help him up, they spotted the other bull quickly charging around the edge of the lake in their direction. Even Paris screamed as she saw the anger on the bull's face, but as it sped straight towards the boys, Corio readied his knife and Rascus held his spear out in defence. Luckily for them, the bull ran straight into Rascus's spear, which hit it in the leg, although it continued to try running forward towards them. Rascus struggled to hold it off with his spear, and so it seemed to be ignoring Corio and channeling all of its aggression towards Rascus instead. As the bull continued pushing forwards, Corio, who was now injured but still capable of movement, was cowering on the ground almost directly underneath it. He realised that Rascus was running out of stamina against this bull, and so he thrust his knife up into the bull's stomach, 
which made it grunt wildly and slip into the mud. It continued moving forward, however, so Corio stabbed it again. This time the bull grunted even louder, but then slowed its movement forward, and after letting out a piercing squeal, it fell to the ground on top of Corio, just as the cannon sounded. Raskus panicked and immediately tried to push the bull's body off Corio, who he worried had just been crushed to death, but due to Raskus's exhaustion, it soon became difficult. Luckily for Corio, it was another tribute who had died, and Irene and Paris rapidly climbed down from the tree and helped Raskus to push off the bull from Corio, who gasped out for air once his face was no longer covered. The girls and Raskus helped lift Corio, but he then proceeded to yell at Paris, claiming that she had left him to be attacked. Paris argued back that he could have run away as well, and the volume between the pair soon raised. Realising that this argument could give away their position to other tributes if it continued, Raskus led Corio away to the lake, and Irene took Paris back towards the tree, so that they were no longer shouting at each other. Raskus checked on Corio's wound, and informed him that it was not too severe, and should soon heal. They then washed their blood-stained shirts in the lake, and Raskus lit a fire to dry them. Meanwhile, Paris cried into Irene's shoulder about the unfairness of the being in the arena. Irene appeared to have a pensive expression on her face throughout Paris's speech, but she still listened to every word that was said. After just over an hour, the group reunited and Corio forgave Paris, which led to the friends embracing and restoring their alliance. As the sunlight faded and dusk set in, they settled down to eat some of the fish and bread, whilst they quietly shared some interesting memories of how their lives had been different since the Second Rebellion. Just as the audience might have been thinking about how these tributes were acting in such a civilised manner, they all simultaneously fell backwards and shook violently. They each continued to shake uncontrollably in the muddy ground, whilst letting out brief cries of pain. After almost 20 seconds had passed, Paris started to be able to lift her head up to watch the others as they all continued moving, although she still found it tough to control this erratic movement. As she looked over to Irene, she noticed that the electronic tracker in Irene's left arm was glowing a light blue through her skin, and she appeared to realise that they were in the process of being electrocuted. Just at that moment, a cannon went off in the distance, but Paris seemed to realise that Irene had been moved backwards from the violent electrocution, and her head was about to make contact with the lake behind her. Despite clearly still feeling a heightened sense of pain, Paris withstood the pain and bravely reached over towards Irene, and although it seemed almost impossible for her to control the movement of her own arms, she managed to grab the foot of Irene, whose ponytail lashed around above the water. Then, just as soon as the electrocution had started, it suddenly ended. Raskus lay unresponsively on the ground, as Corio got up and ran to a tree, before vomiting behind it. Irene and Paris appeared able to hear screams in the distance of other tributes who had also just gone through this experience, and over the next few minutes, the group moaned in pain as they tried to stand again. Irene started to cry due to the intense levels of pain that she had just experienced, but Paris comforted her and said that it was over now. As the group drank some water and healed from this traumatic experience, they appeared to realise that a cannon had gone off during the electrocution, and another had also sounded during the episode with the bulls earlier in the day. Irene then deduced that unlike the hazards of the 75th Hunger Games, they seemed to be happening to all the tributes at the same time, regardless of which sector they were in. She continued to talk about her theory of how these hazards were happening, and the other tributes began to fall asleep. Within a few minutes, Irene fell asleep as well, and as they slept, the portraits of the six fallen tributes were shown in the sky, leaving 18 remaining. The next day, the group awoke whilst the sun was rising. They began to make their way to the perimeter, but Raskus pointed out that the night before, they had carelessly gone to sleep without anyone watching, and that from the following night, at least one of them would need to keep watch as the others slept, which the group agreed to. They marched on through the forest and down a rather steep slope, but just as Raskus was helping Irene down the bottom of the slope, they heard a loud sound in the distance, which Raskus said sounded like a mighty engine. Within seconds of hearing these engines, the group heard screams coming from other sectors, and Corio instantly started running onwards, which made the others follow him. They were in fact very fortunate that they did run, as approximately 30 seconds later, an engine was heard roaring from the top of the slope. They stopped running and looked round to see a small vehicle known as a quad bike, which appeared to not actually be holding a driver, crashing through the trees and landing exactly where they had been gathered at the bottom of the slope. 
Paris was in an apparent state of shock as she watched the bike drive on towards them, but Raskus grabbed her by the hand and practically dragged her towards a tree that had low enough branches to climb. Meanwhile, Corio and Irene continued running on through the forest until they reached a lake, which the pair had to abruptly stop themselves from falling into. Raskus had all but forced Paris to climb the tree before him, and he climbed up behind her. He had just managed to reach a level of the tree that was above the bike's height when it drove itself straight into this tree, which shook the branches and caused Paris to almost fall off her branch. Raskus helped support Paris and shouted at her to hold on. He looked back at the bike reversing, and he appeared to realise that it had knives attached to its wheels. He then grabbed onto Paris, just as the bike slammed back into this tree. She screamed out and this time lost her footing. Fortunately for Paris, Raskus grabbed onto the shoulder of her dress, and although it ripped slightly, it stopped her from falling further to the ground. But when she too appeared to notice the knives on the bike's wheels, she let out a shrill scream. The bike revved its engines and appeared to be going in for another collision with the tree. Raskus shouted at Paris to grab onto his hand, which she managed just as the bike hit the tree. Amazingly, Raskus managed to hold onto Paris's hand, and the bike then manoeuvred itself and sped towards Corio and Irene, just as Paris finally ran out of strength and fell to the ground. Raskus quickly jumped down to check that Paris was not hurt, and she thanked him for saving her, as Corio and Irene heard the bike coming towards them. The pair had been listening to the commotion and standing on the edge of the lake, but when they saw the bike rapidly accelerating in their direction, Irene let out a scared gasp and frantically asked Corio if the bike could go into water. He grabbed her hand and replied, I bloody hope not, before jumping into the water and Irene was pulled in with him. Luckily for Corio and Irene, this risk paid off, and although the bike continued making aggressively loud sounds by the edge of the lake, the pair remained safely in the water until the bike eventually drove away. As Paris and Raskus made their way to the lake in order to check on Corio and Irene, the sound of engines died out. They helped Corio and Irene out of the water, and Raskus set a fire to help dry their clothes, whilst Paris and Corio kept watch. The group proceeded to rest by this lake as the sun continued to shine down on them between the trees. Amazingly, despite a few cuts and minor collisions, none of the 18 tributes died from this more dangerous hazard. The group continued to theorise about how these hazards were working, and why all the tributes seemed to be attacked by the hazards at the same time. Raska stated that the next time something like this happened, they could follow the direction of other tribute screams in order to capture them, but Irene pointed out that they already had enough problems defending themselves, so they should try to lay low, instead of fighting other tributes. Corio and Paris voiced their agreement with Irene, but just as Corio bit into a loaf of bread, he spat it out, then looked at the dissected loaf and said that another hazard had already occurred. The others asked what he meant, and he showed them the loaf, which had gone a putrid light green colour on the inside. Paris ripped apart another loaf of bread to find that it also contained mould inside, much to her annoyance. Each of the group, who were now hungry, voiced their dissatisfaction at not being able to eat this bread, but as they started to argue about how they could access more food, Irene appeared to come to a realisation. She stood up and shouted out, Grain! Paris, Raskus and Corio were all confused by this exclamation, but Irene asked which district produced grain. After a few wrong guesses from Paris and Corio, Raskus correctly stated that it was District 9. Irene continued by asking which district was responsible for transport, and Raskus stated that it was District 6. She then asked if the others understood what was happening. After all three of her allies gave her bewildered looks, Irene mentioned that the electricity and bulls from the day before could represent districts 3 and 10 respectively. She then infamously said that the districts are punishing us with what we demand. Paris immediately argued with this theory and stated that the itchiness they had experienced had nothing to do with any district, but Corio correctly replied to her that it had only been the skin beneath their clothes that had been affected and that something must have caused their clothes to itch. Raskus nonchalantly sighed and muttered, District 8, to which Paris asked if that was the textile one, and Raskus nodded. Irene said that the districts which corresponded to each hazard did not appear to have occurred in a logical order, and Raskus theorised that maybe this was similar to the third quarter quell, where each sector represented a different hazard. Paris reminded Raskus that the hazards had so far happened throughout the arena, but Corio said that maybe there was a way that other tributes were activating these hazards. 
Raska stated that they had not so far seen any way of activating a hazard, but Paris reminded him that they had not yet reached the perimeter. The group quickly agreed to head onwards, towards the perimeter in hopes of finding a hazard trigger, and as they walked, they drank some water and speculated about what hazards might correspond to the remaining districts. In the next 20 minutes, they passed through a rocky terrain near the edge, before reaching the humid vegetation at the perimeter. Corio asked where they might be able to activate a hazard, and Irene suggested that they head to their left along the perimeter to see what they could find, and after a few minutes of walking, they spotted a stone platform with a red podium that featured a button on top. They carefully approached the button and saw that the number 3 was written on it. They also noticed something that looked like a timer was attached to the perimeter behind them and appeared to have run out of time. Corio reached forward and touched the button, but they soon realised that it had already been pressed. Irene then mentioned that District 3 produced electricity, and unbeknownst to the group, it was activated the day before by McLean, who had allied with Bartholomew. Raskus then suggested heading to their left, and they realised that this would mean heading towards the button for District 2. As they marched onwards, they made a variety of guesses as to what the hazard could be. However, as they saw the button, Irene mentioned that it could be something rather dangerous, seeing as District 2 had the best record in the games, which could mean that they would be affected. As they approached the green button, they saw a timer for two hours. Paris asked if they would be safe from the hazard, and Raskus suggested that they all stood on the stone platform and press the button together. Irene and Paris continued to discuss if they should press the button or not, but Corio grinned and said, there's only one way to find out, before quickly pressing the button himself. Paris and Irene shouted at Corio as the button turned red, and Raskus insisted that they stay on the platform. Just then, the timer on the perimeter wall started counting down, and the group were completely silent as they stared at it. A door that had apparently been hidden within the perimeter suddenly burst open, and three fully dressed peacekeepers burst through, straight past the four tributes and into the arena. They looked on in shock at the surreal sight of other people in the arena, but due to the encompassing design of the peacekeeping helmets and masks, it was unknown, even to viewers, who these people were. As they ran through the arena and started hunting for other tributes, Ludo commented that these were the secret assassins for District 2's hazard. When the secret assassins were out of sight from the group, Corio was about to walk off the platform, but Irene stopped him, correctly guessing that they might not be safe from the hazard if they left the platform. As night fell, the group heard the occasional sound of screams, often followed by cannons. It was later revealed to viewers that the secret assassins were Joanna Mason, who killed four tributes with an axe, along with the help of Ina Baria Golding, who bit two tributes' throats, which helped Joanna to kill them. Ina Baria also went on to kill Arabella Snow by pushing her against a tree and growling, Say hello to your grandfather, before biting into Arabella's neck. Callisto Deng, the brother of Artemis Deng, was the third assassin, and he killed one of the other tributes. Dusk fell, and the assassins exited through podiums in the cornucopia. By the time the two hours on the timer had run out, it was completely dark, and Paris, Irene, Corio, and Raskus walked back through the forest to a clearing which they deemed safe. They agreed to sleep and keep watch, and whilst Paris was taking the first watch, she saw the portraits of the six tributes who had all helplessly died at the hands of the assassins. Raskus was the last to keep watch, and he made the others wake up just as the sun was rising the next morning. He mentioned that they should head to the next sector as quickly as possible, in order to trigger the hazard for District 1. Irene mentioned that the other tributes might now know their whereabouts, and so they would need to be quiet as they travelled. They therefore continued along the perimeter, in almost complete silence, until the button for District 1 lay only about 100 metres from them. But they noticed that unlike District 2's button, this button was beneath a small protruding roof. Raskus reminded his allies that they would need to all be on the platform when they pressed the button, but just as he finished his sentence, a knife hit him in the side of his ribs. Paris screamed, and Irene shouted at them all to get down. Corio tried to cover Raskus, and he crouched over him with the trident. Zeus Highbottom, the second highest scorer during assessment, suddenly jumped up from within the forest and threw another knife towards the group. It very nearly hit Irene in the forehead, but she dodged and it only grazed her. Zeus then sprinted through the forest towards the button, and Irene ran in order to try and reach it before Zeus. Corio also ran after Irene, 
but before she was even halfway there, Zeus, who was much taller and hence faster, jumped up onto the platform and slammed his hand down onto the button. As Zeus looked back at the group, Raska shouted that they needed to run, and Paris helped him up to his feet with the limited amount of strength that she had. Zeus threw his last knife at Irene, but she once again dodged and it hit Corio in the shoulder, which sent him falling to the floor. Zeus looked extremely tempted to jump off the platform and run after the group, but he remained where he was. However, as Irene ran forth to help Corio, she felt something hit her skin, and she shouted that it was hail. The viewers had no idea either of what was falling from the sky until Irene, who was still struggling to lift Corio, shouted that diamonds were on the ground, and the pair started screaming in pain, as very small diamonds continued to thud down onto their heads. Paris had managed to drag Raskus to an area under a tree where less of the diamond rainfall was able to hit them, but when they looked back to where Irene and Corio had been, they could not see them, but only hear their shouts of pain. Raskus tried to get up to go and help them, but he stumbled back down in pain. Paris panicked at the sound of Irene and Corio shouting, and she bravely ran through the forest towards Irene, who was desperately trying to lift up Corio while shielding herself and Corio from the diamonds. Paris screamed Corio's name, and as she tried to shield herself, she continued sprinting to them. Despite feeling intense pain from the increasing levels of diamond rain, Paris put her other arm around Corio's waist, and the girls were finally able to lift him. They stumbled through the forest and missed the diamonds to the area where Raskus was now resting, and despite having a few cuts, they were relatively safe. However, Paris suddenly shouted that they had left their weapons back by the perimeter. The others shouted at her to stay, but she ignored their pleas and ran towards the perimeter in order to grab the weapons. As Paris ran, she appeared to notice that the diamonds were now falling more forcefully. She picked up the trident and a diamond appeared to ingrain itself in her hand, and then another ingrained into the back of her neck. She screamed out as more diamonds battered her, but she managed to grab the trident, which she used as a kind of shield. She ran again and had almost made it back to the forest, but just then another diamond came flying down and hit her in the eye. Paris let out her loudest scream so far, and viewers could only imagine what kind of pain she was in. As she collapsed to the ground, Corio ran out from beneath the tree and grabbed onto her unconscious body. Although he was hit by a few more diamonds, one of which ingrained itself in his shoulder wound, he somehow managed to drag Paris and the trident back underneath the tree before collapsing in pain. Irene tended to Paris's wounds as the diamonds continued to fall in the forest around them. Corio also removed some of the diamonds from Paris's neck, but he became faint from the sight of blood and soon passed out. When an hour had passed, the rain started to slow down, and Irene headed out to see if Zeus was still on the platform. Viewers saw that he had gone looking for this group, but luckily for them, he had become disorientated from the diamond rain and was heading back towards the button for District 2. When Irene saw that Zeus had gone, she went to tell the rest of the group. Corio had just about recovered, whilst Raskus had managed to remove the knife from his ribs, and he was now mobile again. However, the damage to Paris's face had become clear, and as she sat up, one could see that her face was covered in bleeding scars that had been caused from the diamond's impact. Irene tried to calm Paris, but as she felt her face, she let out frenzied screams of pain. Over the next hour, Irene fruitlessly tried looking for any type of leaf which could alleviate Paris's pain, and Raskus guarded Irene as she climbed the trees. Corio lay by the tree with Paris, and tried taking her mind off her injuries by joking about their teachers at school, and which boys in their classes he thought were attractive and why. This did manage to amuse Paris to some degree, and she told Corio that although she hated being in the arena, she was glad to at least have him there with her. Corio then told Paris that he was going to check what Irene and Raskus were doing. When he walked away from the tree, Paris crawled over to the lake to get some water. However, just as she was crouched over the lake, she appeared to see her reflection, and she gasped in horror at the wounds on her face. She stared aimlessly at her reflection for about a minute, and then without a word, she limped back to the tree and picked up the knife. A few more tears fell from her uninjured eye as she looked up at the sky and she held the knife to her throat, breathing erratically as she closed her eyes. Corio walked back into the clearing, and he screamed Paris's name, but without hesitation, she sliced the knife across her throat before falling to the ground in a pool of blood. Corio yelled, and this quickly attracted Irene and Raskus, who were also shocked by the sight that greeted them in the clearing. As Irene screamed in horror, Paris's cannon sounded. Over the next minute, Raskus tried asking Corio what happened, but to no avail. 
and a hovercraft swiftly arrived above them. As Corio continued to cry and Irene muttered to herself in shock, Raska stated that other tributes might follow the hovercraft and they needed to leave the area. Corio was hesitant to run, but as the hovercraft appeared and it got ready to retrieve Paris's body, Raskas quickly picked up their weapons and supplies before practically dragging Corio away. The group silently proceeded to their left, and once they made it to a lake, Corio pointed out that they had not eaten for almost 24 hours, which Irene and Raskas had supposedly forgotten about. Raskas caught and cooked some fish from the lake, but before they had even finished eating, Corio insisted that they continued on to the button for District 12, and Raskas and Irene both agreed to Corio's request. Shortly after finishing their fish, the group set off and they arrived at the button within half an hour. As soon as they were all standing on the platform, Corio slammed his hand down on the button. The timer behind the button started counting down from one hour, and nothing appeared to happen for a while, but viewers were able to see that the other eight tributes around the arena rapidly developed rashes and heavy nosebleeds, which even caused some of them to panic and turn on each other. Due to this, two tributes were killed over the next hour, and although some viewers seemed confused as to how this illness was relevant to the coal that was normally produced by District 12, Ludo pointed out that District 12 had recently changed to producing medicine, and that this was a virus that had accidentally been created by the District, which had never been released prior to these games. Towards the end of the hour, the group noticed shouts coming from within this sector, near to the platform. Eventually, the hour ended, and Corio was the first to storm off the platform. He marched straight through the forest to where these shouts had come from. Raskus and Irene struggled to keep up with him, and they tried to warn him that they could be ambushed, but Corio did not seem to care, and continued onwards. Eventually, they found themselves approaching Zeus, who was crawling next to a lake and still bleeding from his mouth. Corio gestured to Raskus' spear, and whispered to him that he should only injure Zeus. Given what happened earlier, Raskus appeared happy to fulfil Corio's request, and he threw the spear through the trees, which hit Zeus through the stomach. Zeus naturally gasped out in pain, and looked to his left at the trio, with an apparent plea for mercy in his eyes. Corio sprinted with his knife towards Zeus and stabbed him in the neck, which made him collapse. Corio continued stabbing Zeus through the face long after his cannon had sounded. After having stabbed him 57 times, Raskus gave Irene a worried look, and they reached forward to try and calm Corio, who was now almost completely covered in Zeus's blood. As the hovercraft approached, Raskus had to pull Corio away from Zeus's body, and they walked away through the forest. That night, the trio rested nearby and kept watch, although they could hardly see anything through the darkness. As Corio slept, it was noted that he would sometimes call out for Paris in his sleep. The portraits of four tributes, including Paris and Zeus, were shown which left just eight tributes remaining. Corio took over from Myrene in the early hours of the fourth day, but as he paced around, presumably in order to wake himself up properly, both Raskus and Irene were awoken by a loud noise in the distance. Irene, who still seemed to be half asleep, asked what the sound was, but before anyone could give her an answer, there was a loud thud, which was slightly closer than the previous one. They continued to look around in confusion, but then heard more thuds coming from other sectors, when a scream and a cannon were heard in the distance, Raskus ordered the others to get up and they grabbed their supplies together. As Irene frantically asked which way they should head, the roots of a nearby tree ripped up from the ground and it started to fall towards them. Raskus grabbed Irene by the arm and tackled her to the ground. Had he not moved her, she would have been crushed, but this near miss caused the group to sprint to their right. As they ran, trees continually came down behind them and on multiple occasions they had to jump over branches to avoid tripping. Splinters of broken wood also hit their sides, which caused Irene in particular an uncomfortable pain. Another cannon was heard as they sprinted onwards, and sunlight peeked over the horizon, but they failed to notice that they were about to collide with the perimeter, and although Raska shouted out to Irene, she failed to stop in time, and was thrown back by the electric current of the perimeter. However, the trio had no way of knowing that the District 7 button, which had been pushed by Regina, only lasted for ten minutes, which had almost ended. As Raska shouted out to Irene, who had landed in a puddle of mud, one more tree started to fall in Raskus's direction, and although he managed to throw himself forward and away from the tree, his right leg became lodged beneath it and he found himself unable to move, which made him call out to Corio for help. Irene lay barely conscious in the puddle as Corio snatched the knife to help Raskus, who was trying to stifle his own cries of pain. 
Corio subsequently ran towards Rascus in order to help him, but when he was just feet away from Rascus, he abruptly stopped and his expression slowly changed. Rascus seemed to be on the verge of tears, but Corio then looked at him and with a bittersweet expression said, Sorry, but I have to kill you. Rascus burst into tears and desperately tried to free his leg as Corio advanced towards him. However, just as Corio reached down, Irene ran over and jumped up onto his back, which knocked him and Irene to the ground as she held onto him. Corio frantically turned around and jabbed the knife in Irene's direction, but she quickly ducked and then kicked him in the face. Raska shouted at Irene that the trident was on the other side of the fallen tree, and she swiftly clambered over this tree to reach it. Corio got up from the ground and ran after Irene, but she had already picked up the trident and was running back towards Corio, which made him flee, and he subsequently tripped over a broken branch. Corio scarpered backwards across the ground as Irene neared him with the trident. As she stood over him and he appeared to realise that his situation was hopeless, Corio looked at Irene and told her that he was sorry. Irene then jammed the prongs of the weapon through Corio's throat. Seconds later, his cannon sounded. Irene held onto the trident and turned to face Rascus, who was still pinned beneath the tree. Rascus's eyes were filled with tears, and he begged Irene not to kill him. Irene looked into his eyes for a few seconds, and the atmosphere in Viewing Square was full of tension as she approached him. To many viewers' surprise, Irene started to push the tree with all her might, and Rascus quickly tried to help her. This combined effort eventually freed Rascus's leg, and he was able to move himself from under the tree. As Corio's body was removed by the hovercraft and Rascus lay in exhaustion, he thanked Irene for saving him. Interestingly, Irene stated that as she and Rascus were both descendants of district victors, they could try and appeal to Inabari's better nature, in order to be allowed to win together. Rascus nodded and seemed hopeful of this plan, before agreeing with Irene. Ludo reminded viewers that Irene was indeed the great-granddaughter of Justice Al-Fayed, who won the Eighth Games, and Rascus was the grandson of Emerald Bocelli, formerly Rivelta, who won the 34th Games. The duo decided to head to the sector which contained the hazard for District 4, as they deduced that a water or fish-based hazard would be the most likely to eliminate their remaining opponents. Rascus and Irene stopped to eat at noon. As they ate, they discussed who was still alive, and although they correctly asserted that McCain and Bartholomew remained, they failed to remember that Regina was also still alive. Yet as they continued walking, it started to get dark, and when they were within minutes of the button for the District 4 hazard, Irene quickly silenced Rascus when she saw McCain and Bartholomew step onto the path in front of them, and then walk ahead in the same direction. Luckily for Irene and Rascus, McLean and Bartholomew continued without noticing the former pair, However, Irene whispered to Rascus that they were probably heading to the button as well, and that they would therefore reach it before her and Rascus. After a few seconds, Rascus suggested cutting through the forest and ambushing McLean and Bartholomew by the button. They therefore ran as quietly and quickly as they could in a direction that was parallel to the path, until they were in the rocky terrain close to the perimeter, and the button was in sight. Rascus and Irene could hear their opponents approaching, and so they proceeded to wait for them behind the rocks. Within a minute, McLean and Bartholomew had reached a close enough distance, and Rascus quietly gave a signal to Irene. They suddenly shot up from behind these rocks, and Rascus threw a spear at Bartholomew. Although Bartholomew spotted what was about to happen, he did not jump away quickly enough, and he was pierced in his left lung by this spear. However, McLean easily dodged the knife that Irene threw, and he sprinted towards her. McLean threw a large stone back at Irene's head, which caused her to fall back with a shriek of pain. As Bartholomew tried to get back up, McLean threw another stone, which grazed Rascus's head and made him fall back against the rock as well. McLean strangled Irene, and although she managed to kick him in the groin, he proceeded to punch her in the face. Rascus got back up with his trident, but McLean turned and kicked the trident away before punching Rascus in the face. Yet during this time, neither Irene, Rascus, nor McLean had noticed that Bartholomew had managed to get back up and stumble through the rocks to the left of where this fight was taking place. Despite bleeding profusely from his chest wound and appearing to be at death's door, Bartholomew collapsed onto the platform and crawled to the button, before slamming his hand onto it and then passing out. The other three tributes who had been fighting looked over in surprise at the sound of the button being hit. At that moment, an aquatic sound started making its way along the perimeter and the expressions of Irene Rascus and McLean 
quickly turned to terror. Without wasting any time, the three of them all sprinted from the perimeter and towards the cornucopia. As they ran away and Irene stuffed the knife into her pocket, a cannon sounded, which was revealed to belong to Bartholomew, who had now died on the platform from blood loss. After two minutes, the three of them had made it just over halfway to the cornucopia. It was then that viewers saw a wave of about three metres in height permeate through all sectors of the perimeter before starting to roll inwards through the arena, knocking over almost every tree in its path. Irene, Raskus and McLean let out panic screams as they heard the wave crashing towards them from behind, and they continued to run, but the wave was quickly catching up on them. Within a minute, they were just a few hundred metres from the cornucopia, but it was then that the wave caught up with them. By now, the wave had slowed down, but it still swept the trio off their feet as they ran. Along with the broken tree branches, they were carried with the current of the water in the direction of the cornucopia. It was not until approximately 30 seconds had passed that Raskus rose to the surface and coughed up water, before gasping for air. He grabbed onto a tree branch and shouted out for Irene, who was nowhere to be seen. Within the next minute, McLean also made it to the surface and grabbed onto the same tree as Raskus, although the pair appeared too busy to be dealing with the water's current to fight with each other. Irene proceeded to float to the surface just metres in front of them, and Raskus swam ahead and grabbed onto her before pulling her head out of the water. She appeared to be unconscious, but Raskus checked her pulse and was pleased to see that she was still alive. He then pulled Irene's limp body closer so that she was not pulled away again by the current. The current had slowed down and the trio had now floated back into the cornucopia clearing. However, in a rare move of compassion between tributes, McLean pointed out to Raskus that the roof of the cornucopia was above water and that they could rest there. By the time they had all made it onto the cornucopia, the sun had almost set, and Raskus tried to wake up Irene, who was now in a slumber, although realising that she was alive, he left her to sleep. Raskus seemed confused that McLean was helping them, but McLean appeared to sense this, and so he told Raskus that they were better than the district savages, and that they should stop killing each other in order to show this. Although Raskus looked like he had various opinions on this suggestion, both he and McLean now appeared to be overcome with exhaustion, and so he simply nodded before almost immediately passing out with fatigue. Within a few minutes, all three of them were asleep, apparently without weapons, but still alive. By the time the sun rose the next day, only Raskus, Irene, McLean and Regina were still alive. Whilst the former three lay asleep on top of the cornucopia, Regina woke up from her sleep on the branch of a tree in Sector 8 that had withstood the wave. Whilst looking around the arena, that was now a lot more transparent, Regina appeared to spot her remaining opponents on top of the cornucopia, and she carefully made her way through the water. When she was within a close enough distance, she grabbed a sharp branch from the water before reaching the cornucopia as the others still slept, seemingly oblivious to the threat that was now approaching. Regina very slowly climbed up the side of the cornucopia so that she did not make a sound. She then examined her sleeping targets to see who she should aim to kill first. It was then that she appeared to decide on McLean, and she crept over to him, before raising the spike of the branch. Within seconds, Regina brought it down through McLean's brain, and he let out a small muffled scream as blood splattered against Regina's dress. This immediately woke Irene and Raskus, the former of whom initially seemed confused about where they were, whilst Regina tried to pull the branch from McLean's head. Irene ran at Regina, and just as Regina pulled the branch from McLean's head, his cannon sounded, and Irene tackled Regina, which made her drop the branch. The girls each put up an impressive fight against each other, as Raskus, who was now unarmed, quickly got up. He ran towards Regina, but slipped and hurt his arm as he fell. Regina managed to grab Irene by the hair, and she bashed her head repeatedly against the roof, but it was then that Raskus saw the branch that Regina had used, which was now on the ground. He ran over and grabbed it, before thrusting it as hard as he could through Regina's brain. The spike came out of Regina's eye, and as she fell forward onto Irene, her cannon sounded. Irene cried out and shook as Regina's blood poured onto her face. She begged Raskus to help, and he looked down at her, possibly thinking about what he should do. As she wiped Regina's blood from her face, Irene showed her empty hands to remind Raskus that she was unarmed. Raskus threw the stick into the water, and offered his hand to Irene, and despite still shaking from the feel of Regina's blood on her face, Irene accepted Raskus' hand, and as she stood up, she looked out from the roof of the cornucopia, 
and shouted that they were both of district blood and that they should live. Raskus joined in and shouted similar things to Irene, but as he became louder and more impatient with the lack of interaction from the game makers, he failed to notice that whilst Irene was also shouting, she was edging closer to his side and moving her hand towards her back pocket. Not even the viewers had seen that whilst they were running from the wave, Irene had forced the knife into this pocket of her trousers which she zipped closed, just seconds before the wave had hit her. As the other weapons had been washed away, this meant that she had a knife, whilst Raskus did not. Raskus was almost on the verge of tears as he continued shouting out into the arena, but Irene had almost stopped and now had the knife ready in her hand. It was then that she forced it into the side of Raskus's neck. Blood spurted from the wound that was quickly formed and onto Irene's face, but this time she hardly reacted. Raskus's eyes moved across to Irene in a wave of confusion, and he fell to his knees as she twisted the knife. Raskus appeared to have lost all control of his body, and Irene hoisted up his head by grabbing onto his hair. Irene then apologised to Raskus before slicing the knife across his throat, and he fell to the ground as more blood flew out. Within a few seconds, Raskus's cannon sounded, and Irene broke down in tears next to his body. Game maker Golding subsequently announced Irene to be the winner of the Capital Games, and as the hovercraft approached, she threw the knife into the water and then stood dazed and disorientated. During the victor's interview, Irene still seemed to be somewhat phased from her victory, and she burst into tears when Ludo mentioned the fact that she had killed Corio and Raskus. However, the audience still cheered her on, and she was given a standing ovation at the end of this interview. Irene lived a quiet life for the next few years, and continued her studies with a private tutor. During the summer of 81, she was stabbed by Velma Bocelli, the sister of Raskus. This incident occurred in a bathroom at the nightclub Breen's, but luckily some other patrons were able to restrain Velma and save Irene from dying. She spent the next two weeks recovering in Ravenstill Hospital, and Velma was sentenced to a ten-year prison term. Following the reclamation, Irene became the representative for District 6, where she met and married her husband, Harlem Hicks, before having two sons with him. Thank you all once again for watching, and I wish everyone the best over the next week. And I'd also like to give out an honourable mention to Andrew McLean for all the art that he created for this episode. If you like what you saw, please check his site, which I've included in the description, and you will see even more pictures associated with this series. And I'd also like to voice my gratitude once again to my Patreons. Your support is really appreciated, and I still can't thank you enough. And if you too would like to help me produce this series further into the future, feel free to become one of my Patreons, and in return, you will be able to see the pre-game section early each week. The link to my Patreon is in the description, as well as the link to my Twitter, and the Tales of the Hunger Games Reddit, and many other sites that you will likely want to visit if you enjoy this series. And until next time, take care and stay safe wherever you are.